ask Professor Johnson to begin. Thank you very much, Professor Johnson, for being with us. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for uh, for taking the time this afternoon. I realize we have people have busy schedules. Um, so what I'm going to do is is talk probably for you know, 20, 25 minutes uh, to try to give some initial thoughts about the the election, also what what is going to be coming. But also, I want to make sure that I uh, leave lots of times for uh, uh, for for questions. Um, so th there, there are lots of ways to look at what happened on, on Tuesday, but one of the most straightforward is, is that in effect, what we saw was the reverse of 2016. In 2016, the decisive states were Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and in 2016, uh, uh, Trump very narrowly carried all three of these states. In 2020, Biden narrowly carried, well, very narrowly carried Wisconsin, um, somewhat narrowly carried uh, um, Michigan, and uh, uh, narrowly carried Pennsylvania. There's still uh, a few votes remaining in Pennsylvania in the sense is that almost all of these votes are Democratic, so it's likely Biden is going to win Pennsylvania by around two, uh, two percentage points. Um, and if Trump had carried all three of these states, uh, Trump would have been reelected. So, you know, as in 2016, this really was the decisive part of the, the country, although as I'll be mentioning in, in a couple of minutes, there were some other uh, fairly significant changes. So one way of looking at these three states' results is that this, this was a vindication of the uh, of the party establishment. Um, I think what we witnessed this spring, and of course it was before the virus, and so it seems like that was 65 years ago or something, but it was actually only, you know, only a few months ago, um, is really the closest thing to, uh, to a kind of uh, convention stampede in the, in the post-primary uh, uh, period. So you know, in, in the past, um, oftentimes it'd be a long shot candidate who would come into the convention, would sort of rally the party. William Jennings Bryan for the Democrats in 1896 was the most famous, arouse passions, get in. in theory, once we move towards the um, uh, towards the uh, uh, primary process, the choice was made by the people, no longer by the party establishment. Uh, but if you think back to the 10-day period after the Nevada caucuses, so this is when Bernie Sanders uh, did his 60 Minutes interview, <laughs> ruminating about how wonderful Fidel Castro's literacy uh, programs were, um, and it culminated on Super Tuesday, there were multiple interventions within the process. First, Jim Clyburn endorsed uh, Joe Biden, uh, then a variety of figures within the uh, within the party pressured uh, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar to get out of the race before Super Tuesday, which threw most of their votes to uh, uh, to Biden. And then, as everyone else was being pressured to get out of the race, uh, Elizabeth Warren suddenly developed a huge super PAC that was running ads on her behalf and seemed to siphon votes away from, uh, from Sanders. And the net result of this was really to throw the nomination to Biden under the sense that Biden was the strongest candidate against Trump. And I think that's what we saw from these three uh, uh, states on Tuesday, is that Biden did significantly better than Clinton with white working class areas. And it's not at all clear to me that any other Democratic nominee, certainly not uh, uh, Warren or Mike Bloomberg, and probably not Sanders, um, would have done anywhere near as well. So to a certain extent, the story of 2016 and the, and the story of 2020 is the same, that because of the way the current polarized map breaks down, the decisive voters are white, non-college educated voters in the upper Midwest, and both parties need to find a way to, uh, to appeal to them. That's the sort of the good side for the Democrats is the Democrats nominated a candidate who, who could appeal to them. The danger side for the Democrats, I think moving forward with these three states is that there's virtually no representation for this wing of the electorate in the Democratic House or Senate caucus. And so there, there's a tee up here for a possible pretty significant backlash if a President Biden can't deliver for, um, uh, for these voters. So this is, I think the first and the most significant aspect of this. Biden won because he won these three states States, which Obama had twice carried, which defected to Trump in 2016, and which then flipped back to uh, to Biden in uh, in 2020. 
The one other thing I think that we've all witnessed, especially in Pennsylvania, is the chaotic nature of the uh, of the count. And and you know if if I could make me czar for one day and change how uh, uh, elections are are done, um, I live in Maine. And and one of the things that that we do here is we have a robust early voting pattern in person. We also have a robust mail-in pattern. And the way Maine state law works is that all of these votes are cast into the same pot as people who vote on election day, and the votes are all counted together simultaneously on uh, on election night. So there's no way of knowing who the early what the early vote totals are and vice versa. But this varies from state to state. And as we've witnessed over the last three days in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania had a policy of counting election day votes first and only then counting the mail-in ballots. They also had a, a curious palace policy of doing it county by county, where sometimes uh, 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 the the county election workers and this was this happened in Philadelphia decided to go home early rather than continue to count votes. Um, so the result was that huge numbers of Biden votes, which everyone knew were coming, were not counted until yesterday or or today. And you know, for all of us who were pretty well informed politically, I mean, we knew what was coming, and so this wasn't a big uh, a big deal. But in terms of of sort of efficient election administration, this is not how the process should. Uh, uh, should go. So these were, were were three of the six entities that swung from Trump to uh, to Biden. Uh, I use entities because the fourth was the second district of Nebraska. Nebraska is one of these two states that allocates by congressional district. This is, and this was a surprise even to me, um, one of the highest number, highest percentage number of college educated voters in the country in Nebraska's second district. This is Omaha and its uh, suburbs, and it swung more heavily to the Democrats than any other congressional district in the uh, in the country. The other two were Arizona and Georgia. Georgia, I'm going to be talking about a little bit uh, later. Arizona, um, I think, is quite different than the upper Midwest. This is now two elections in a row where the Democrats have done very well in Arizona. And this is part of a broader pattern in the Trump years. Basically under Trump, and this is a slight oversimplification, Republicans have done better with white working class voters and have done much worse with white suburban voters. And in a state like Arizona, that is really problematic because even though you know it's a big state on the map geographically, politically Arizona is a big suburb. Um, two thirds of the votes in Arizona come from Maricopa County, which is Phoenix. This is a traditionally Republican area. Barry Goldwater, a name I know all the faculty know, many of the students may know as well. This was Goldwater's base. This was also John McCain's base. So these were suburbs, but politically conservative suburbs, which have shifted heavily towards the Democrats in the last four years. So this is the current count for Maricopa County. Biden carried it by 3.2%. Uh, 3 He's carrying the state by uh, a bit less than that, but essentially you can't win in Arizona without carrying Maricopa County. And so projecting ahead, I think these three upper Midwest states are likely to be very close in 2024, and I could see them switching back to, uh, to the Republicans. Arizona, by contrast, seems to me to be a state that's shifting more permanently towards the Democrats as the Democrats consolidate this, uh, this suburban vote. Democrats also picked up a Senate seat in, uh, in Arizona in a race that was not particularly uh, uh, close. This was Mark Kelly. So the Democrats now have two, uh, two, both Senate seats in Arizona for the first time since 1952. That's a long time uh, ago. Um, and both of the senators from Arizona, Kirsten Seminar and, and Kelly, are very talented political figures. I mean, Seminar, I think, is one of the two or three most just raw political talents in the uh, in the Senate. So this was a significant shift, and I think it's for, it's foreshadowing a broader uh, approach. All that said, this is a partial map. This is put together by the New York Times. This is their arrow map. They did another one of these in 2016, and more of the arrows will be filled in as the as the votes become finalized elsewhere. So the way you understand this map, if you see a red arrow uh, moving towards the right, that means the vote shifted rightward from 2016. If you see a blue arrow shifting towards the left, that means it shifted towards the Democrats. 
you see the biggest arrow in the country. This is Nebraska's second uh, district. But one of the striking things to me about this map is that you see lots of red on this map. So this is not 2016 or 2008, the Obama win, where the country shifted entirely Democratic. In 2016, it shifted almost entirely Republican. This really was a very divided country, even at the presidential level. And so what we, you know, in effect, what we moved towards was a narrow Trump win in 2016 to a narrow Trump loss in 2020. And the most significant of these rightward uh, shifts, which I think is significant for a variety of reasons, came in Florida. Um, th this was an extraordinary and, and in many ways unanticipated result. Not that Trump won Florida. I thought Trump was likely to win Florida. It is a state that's slightly more Republican than the, uh, than the norm. It's that Trump won Florida in 2016 by 1%. Um, he's going to win Florida uh, in 2020 by a little over 3%. And if you look up here at northern Florida on the map, these dark red counties, these are heavily white uh, sort of southern uh, uh, style counties. Trump didn't do any better there. Uh, in 2020 than he did in 2016. Instead, Trump did much better in Southern Florida among Hispanic voters, where there was a significant shift uh, towards the Republicans, not just towards Trump, but in the House races as well. The biggest House upset of Tuesday night came in the Miami, Florida district where Donna Shalala, um, a former academic uh, chancellor at Wisconsin and at Miami of Florida, um, who was elected in, in a district that Hillary Clinton carried by 20 points in 2016, was elected in 2018, um, uh, lost by four, uh, four points last night. And you can see from this chart, this is just Florida voters, um, how the vote shifted. Biden actually gained ground among older voters, gained ground slightly among college graduates. This should have been enough for, for the win. But where Trump gained in Florida between 2016 and 2020 was overwhelmingly among non-white voters. Um, and you could say, all right, Florida is a weird state. You know, you have Cubans, you have Venezuelans. These are not necessarily representative voters. But the problem here for the Democrats is that these kinds of patterns appeared in other states wholly unexpectedly in, in what is you know, a truly shocking result to me. Donald Trump received a higher share of the non-white vote than any Republican presidential candidate since 1960. So you know, there, there's something going on here beneath the surface. These are, uh, are, are reports from Southern uh, Texas, um, the, the counties on the border between Texas and, uh, and Mexico are overwhelmingly Hispanic. They tend to be quite moderate uh, counties. So these are not ultra liberal uh, uh, people. They tend to be relatively rural. And so you look at these two counties. So we have Star counties, um, uh, you know, kind of right on the border, went from a 60 point Clinton margin to a five point Biden margin. That's, a, that's just a stunning shift. And then Zapata County, which Obama carried by 43, which Hillary carried by 33, was actually carried by Trump in 2020. And again, there aren't tons of voters in these counties, but it's a, it's a reminder of how things are, are, are shifting at the, uh, at the base level. And among another group of non-white voters, there also was something of a shift. Asian American uh, voters shifted more heavily towards Republicans in 2020. And maybe the best example of this came in this uh, 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 statewide referendum in California to eliminate uh, California in the 90s in, it, installed in their state constitution a measure to outlaw the use of affirmative action in state contracts and in higher education. And that's really the key area with regards to higher education. Uh, the legislature tried to repeal this a couple of years ago. And although white and black Democrats in the legislature uh, wanted it, uh, Asian American Democrats overwhelmingly opposed. They couldn't get it through the legislature. So instead they went back to the ballot box. Um, the pro repeal people, so those would be the pro affirmative action people, uh, outspent the opponents 14 to one, which would suggest a likely victory. Um, and instead it was overwhelmingly defeated um, Asian voters voted three to two against the measure of similar percentage as uh, as white voters. And in Southern California, it looks possible, although th these these results are very close and California is a little like New York, where they're still counting ballots, you know, 95 days after the election, it seems like. Um, but there are two uh, congressional districts in, in Southern California where the Republicans nominated Korean American women 
both of whom are currently ahead of Democratic members of, uh, of Congress. So there was this real effort on the part of California Republicans in 2020 to reach out to Asian American voters in a way I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of over the next four years. So one of the lessons to me from, uh, from what we saw last night is that you know we're not in a black and white country anymore. We all knew this and that Hispanic and Asian American voters are likely to become more important over the next four years as both parties try to uh, uh, duel for their, their support. So the second big thing from the night where it was, was the Senate elections. And you know, if, if those of you who were here for the talk that I did before the election, one of the points that I made in 20, and this happened again in 2020, is that over the last 20 years, and this is not the, the this had, up until then not been the normal pattern in American history. The pattern has been that close Senate elections tend to go for one party rather than sort of splitting 50-50, even though that's a little counterintuitive. And that's exactly what happened Tuesday night. The close Senate elections overwhelmingly went towards uh, towards the Republicans. And there were two of the two classes of these elections. So first, there were the kind of red states where the Republicans were polling poorly and where it looked like until a few days before the elections, the Democrats might take these seats. So in uh, in Texas, where John Cornyn uh, was under 50 percent throughout the campaign, but was easily reelected. In Kansas, where a Democrat hasn't been elected to the Senate since 1932, but the, the Democrats had a dream candidate, a former Republican state legislator who was leading in a couple of the polls, but she got crushed in the end, lost by 12 points. In Montana, the Democrats had the strongest possible candidate, the governor of the state, Steve Bullock, who was very popular, done a great job, loses by 11. In Alaska, all of the votes are not in. The votes that are still to come in are going to be probably more Democratic, but the the, uh, the Democratic candidate who was tied in some of the polls looks like he's gonna lose by between 15 and 20 points when all of the votes are, are counted. And maybe the biggest in this classification, uh, Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, who was tied or behind in a couple of polls against an extremely well-financed uh, Democrat, Jamie Harrison, uh, wound up being reelected by, by 10 points. So in all of these races, the Republicans held. And then in what were the three key Senate races in Iowa, in North Carolina, and in Maine, so these were three races where the Republican incumbent was trailing in polls a week before the uh, election, but the Democrat wound up winning. In Iowa, the state just seems to have reverted back towards Republican, uh, kind of Republican approach, and Joni Ernst, who didn't run a particularly good campaign, was reelected. In North Carolina, this this was, I think, a, a something of a surprise. The incumbent Republican is a, a dull and quite colorless uh, figure, Tom Tillis. The Democrats had a perfect challenger on paper, an army officer who ran as a man of integrity and family values, but it turns out had been having affairs with half the women in the state and uh, uh, wound up uh, you know, being, being defeated. My favorite thing from this campaign was when the first woman that he was having an affair with told her friends how disappointed she was to discover he was having an affair with another woman as he was still married to his wife. And this all led to the to what was the most uncomfortable press conference of the 2020 uh, elections when he was asked four times whether there were additional women with whom he had had affairs and he repeatedly refused to answer the question. By the end of the, by voting day, there were four women who had come, come out and said they had, and I mean, if people have affairs, you know, it, it, to me, I don't, it doesn't really matter, but you can't run as a candidate of family values and integrity if you have this as your, uh, as your background. And then what was the single biggest upset of the entire election night, which was Susan Collins's victory in Maine. So here's the final county map in Maine. Collins carried every county by two. Um, she won by eight points after having trailed in every single public poll in the 2020 election. I cannot think of a single um, uh, Senate candidate, and this goes back uh, uh, more than 20 years, about whom that could be said. I mean, she was essentially written off. And this was a case, I think, where probably the, the, the financial advantage worked to the Democrats' disadvantage. The, the challenger, Sarah Gideon, who was the Speaker of the State House, spent $118 million on her campaign, focused on a message that Collins was corrupt, which was just not, I mean, Collins is a conservative, but 
no one really thinks that she's corrupt. Uh, and then Gideon had one of these great faux pas in, in the last debate. She said that she was running to stand up and vote against Republican judges. Um, and so Collins asked her, if you had been in the Senate in the Bush years, would you have voted not to confirm uh, Chief Justice Roberts? And Gideon said she didn't know. She said she'd have to look at his record to make her decision. And this was supposedly the reason that she was running. And it created this impression that she was sort of not up to the, uh, up to the task. So the net result of this is the Democrats now have 48 Senate seats. The Republicans are going to have 50. Uh, and the center of the political universe for the next two months is going to be on Georgia, which was, you know, a, a a reminder that states are not static, they're constantly changing. So these two maps, these are a gubernatorial comparison maps between 94 and 2018, basically the same outcome. So we have two 50-50 governor's races uh, separated by a gap of 24 years. Counties that are blue on the map uh, were carried by the Democratic candidate. Counties that are red on the map were carried by the Republican candidate. The darker the county, the heavier the margin. The key map here is this third map over on the right, which shows how the counties in Georgia have shifted. So basically, Metro Atlanta has become heavily Democratic, and everywhere else in the state has become heavily Republican. This is part of broader patterns in American society. Higher percentage of college graduates now live in Metro Atlanta. Higher percentage of Hispanics and Asian Americans live in Metro uh, uh, Atlanta. To give one just incredible example of the presidential uh, race, Biden carried Georgia by the tiniest of tiny uh, uh, margins, carried it largely because he had scored this unbelievable victory into Kalb County, which is right to the east of Atlanta. So it's a so it's a white suburb, uh, white suburban county, lots of college graduates. Um, Biden carried it by around 250,000 votes. In 1988, this was a 50-50 county. And just look at the total vote totals into Kalb County. So there were far fewer people who lived there. So these are all people who have moved into Georgia in the last uh, 20 years and have made it this very uh, different uh, kind of state. So it's basically now a 50-50 state uh, politically. So the reason why Georgia is going to become the center of attention for the next, uh, you know, the next two months is that Georgia will decide who controls the, uh, the Senate. Um, both of the Georgia races are heading towards a, uh, towards a runoff. Um, Georgia has a, they're, they're the only state in the country that has such a law. If a candidate doesn't get 50% of the vote in the general election, even if there are third parties in the race, the race then goes to a runoff after the election. Other states have top two systems or up in Maine, we have a ranked choice, ranked choice system where votes are reallocated, but Georgia has this, um, uh, this, this uh, runoff uh, system. In the Senate, it's only happened twice in Georgia history that there has been a runoff, and in both instances, the pattern was the same. The number of voters declined between the November general election and the January runoff, which is basically what you would expect, and that the Republicans were more likely to turn out to vote in a special election than were the Democrats. So in 1992, which was the first time this had happened, um, a guy named Weich Fowler, who was the incumbent Democrat, got 49.9% in the general election, just couldn't make it, but in the runoff lost uh, to Paul Coverdale, who wound up serving uh, a little over a term. Coverdale won these suburbs, which are no longer uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Republican suburbs. But you can see here, Fowler carried all of these rural areas, which are no longer Democratic uh, uh, areas. The more interesting one, and maybe the more relevant one for us, was in 2008, the incumbent Republican Saxby Chambliss was, was just below the 50% uh, threshold against uh, a state rep, a low profile campaign, um, but then just crushed uh, in the uh, the runoff with, uh, with 57%. And if you look down at the bottom of the screen, to me, the most interesting thing, the comparison between the general and the runoff in Georgia in 2008 is to look at just how many fewer voters there were between the general election and the runoff election. So there was a real drop. Now, whether this will happen this time is, uh, uh, is, is I think, unclear. So th there are two ways in which these, these two runoff elections might favor the, uh, uh, the Republicans. There are two ways in which they might favor the, uh, the Democrats. 
So the ways in which they might favor the Republicans, the first is you, you can see from this map. So this is a map uh, that was put out uh, this morning by Patrick Ruffini, who runs a, a, a a, a political polling firm called Echelon is a really good, those of you who are on Twitter, he's a really good data uh, uh, journalist to uh, to follow. So this, this map shows the, it's a comparison between Republican Senate performances and Trump presidential performances. Uh, the orange appropriately on the map are precincts, uh, counties, excuse me, where Trump performed better than the Republican Senate candidate in the state. Um, Note here down in these Hispanic areas in Southern Texas. Um, the blue are counties where the Republican Senate candidate performed better than Trump. And if you look at Georgia, the Republican Senate candidate, David Perdue, uh, uh, there were two elections uh, uh, for Feeney just used the, the, the regular election, performed better than Trump basically in the entire state. So there is a sliver of Georgians around one, between one and one five, Point five percent who voted for Biden, but also voted for Purdue. You know, so these are people who Republicans who just didn't like Trump. So Purdue was really coming into the general election, I think, as or the runoff election as a narrow favorite in that respect. And then the second advantage that the the Republicans have is a messaging advantage. The the message that the Republicans are going to use in these two special elections, I think, is straightforward: vote for us, or AOC is going to control. Uh, the entire national politics because the Democrats will have full control of the uh, of Congress. This is a simplistic message, it's an incorrect message, but politically I think it will be a pretty powerful message. We will be the check on you know the the extremist Democrats in the uh, in the Congress. The Democratic message is going to be harder. I mean, if you think of really the two central messages that Biden ran on, they were "I'm not Trump," and "I'm going to promote." unity in in the country. Neither of those translate to a, a clear message of what of why people should vote democratic in a in, in a special election. So those are the advantages for the for the Republicans. But there are two really big advantages, I think, for the Democrats in the special election. The first is money. Um, if I had to guess 500 million maybe will be spent in Georgia over the next two months. Um, I could easily see Bloomberg cutting a check for 80 or 100 million alone on to provoke get out the vote efforts, because it's not just, you know, you have to understand what control of the Senate means. This is not legislation that, that matters. What matters here is if the Republicans control the Senate, that means they control Senate committees. That means they can issue subpoenas and they can spend the next two years investigating the Biden administration through subpoenas. And the Democrats here are going to be stuck because over the last two years in these court cases between the House and Trump, the Democrats have articulated an extremely broad conception of congressional oversight authority. So it's going to be very hard for them now to run to those courts and say, oh, we didn't mean anything that we said really congressional subpoenas don't matter. So to take the obvious example, Ron Johnson, a name that some of you may know, the Wisconsin senator who's been sort of this cartoonish promotion of the Russia uh, uh, hoax uh, theory, you know, he's going to be subpoenaing Hunter Biden from now until the cows come home if the Republicans have the Senate. So this, you know, this matters. And that, that's, I think, why the, why the big money is going to come in. The second reason why this matters is if there were just one runoff, if, if it were Purdue against the Democratic opponent, John Ossoff, I think Purdue would win. He's just, a, he's, he's a better candidate. But there are two runoffs because there was a special election caused by the resignation of the um, uh, uh, of, of the incumbent senator, a guy named Johnny Isaacson. And while Purdue was a pretty good candidate, um, the, the, the candidate in the second runoff, uh, an appointed uh, candidate named Kelly Leffler, is is one of the worst Senate candidates I've seen in any state in the country in the last 20 years. She was appointed on the belief that she could, she's she's wealthy. She uh, co-owns an N, uh, a WNBA basketball team. She was appointed under the belief that she could appeal to suburban women in Atlanta. She was then challenged in this campaign by a far right Republican congressman and reinvented herself as an ultra conservative. She proudly accepted the endorsement of the QAnon congresswoman who was uh, elected from Northern Georgia. Uh, and she ran a series of TV ads, um, three of them, which swung the uh, the Republican swing of the special election towards her, in which she boasted about being to the right of Attila the Hun. So here, here's the first of these ads. Mm -hmm. 
Did you know Kelly Leffler was ranked the most conservative senator in America? Yep, she's more conservative than Attila the Hun. Fight China. Got it. Attack big government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, eliminate the liberal scribes. More conservative than Attila the Hun. Uh-oh. Kelly Leffler, 100% Trump voting record. I'm Kelly Leffler. I approve this message. So, so try to think of a candidate who, who could best appeal to suburban women in, in Atlanta. <laughs> to the right of Attila the Hun is really not the message here. So, so it's entirely possible that Leffler, who's facing this very interesting, although inexperienced uh, uh, candidate, uh, Reverend Warnock, who is the, the pastor of MLK's former church, it's possible that Leffler may drag down the entire ticket in uh, uh, in Georgia. One pattern, and this it's, it's an intriguing one, is that when states have two Senate elections, and this happens from time to time due to deaths or resignations. Um, you have to go back 50 years to find an occasion where the, the state voted for one member of one in one election, the Democrats won in the other election, the Republicans won. So the likelier outcome here in Georgia is that um, you know, it's either going to be a tell of the Hun or the or the Democrats who will who will win, but it's probably not going to be a split uh, a split vote. Well one other comment before before uh, we have some some questions. The the other interesting thing from from uh, Tuesday, which is only beginning to get some attention, were in the House races. Um, there was no expectation that the Republicans would regain the House in large part because the Republicans recruited just incredibly poorly this time around. So the only debate going into the election was how many seats the Democrats would win. Then the people voted, and what we've discovered is now the only debate is how many seats the Republicans are going to win. They may actually pick up 10 seats. And leading here is New York. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really interesting aspect of this election that, that Republican House candidates did quite well in Southern Florida, in New York, and in California. These, these seats that we think of as blue areas. Um, so in upstate New York, uh, Anthony Brindisi, who's one of the most conservative Democrats currently in Congress, is almost certainly going to lose. In Staten Island and Bay Ridge, Max Rose, a moderate and really interesting uh, uh, congressman, is very likely to lose. It's true there are still votes that are going to come in, but I, I, he seems to be too far behind. In Long Island, I, my sense is that Congressman Swazi is likely to uh, to win once the late votes come in. But this was an election that wasn't even supposed to be close. And as in 2016, there was a huge surge of uh, of Republican votes on Long Island towards Trump. I mean, this this seems to be Staten Island and Long Island are sort of the Trumpiest of Trumpy areas in the uh, in the country. And this is part of a broader pattern where where Republicans won. And and the interesting thing, and in some ways the troubling thing here, I think, in terms of, of, of where politics are, is that the seats that Republicans have, have won, which you can see here in the kind of dark red on the map, um, were disproportionately, uh, down here on the South Carolina coast as well, disproportionately, they picked off the most moderate members of the Democratic caucus. So the result is that the 2021 House is going to be a much more polarized House. The, the Democrats are going to be much more liberal. The Republicans are going to be more uh, more conservative. And so, you know, if you, if you thought the last two years in the House was dysfunctional, just wait, because that's what we're going to be getting over the next uh, the next few years as uh, as well. So I think that this this was a really interesting election outcome in a lot of different uh, uh, ways that um, you know Biden won as the polls had predicted, although the numbers were less and there are lots of reasons as to why the polls might have gotten it wrong this time around. Part of the reason I think was that they just missed this this movement among uh, Hispanic and 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 Asian American voters in Florida and Texas, in New Mexico, where the Senate race was supposed to be a safe Democratic seat and the Democrat only won by four points. It's hard for polls to to pick up movements among small demographic groups. So imagine in a poll of the United States as a whole. So the polling company polls, you know, twelve hundred people. They might include four Hispanic voters from Florida in that poll. So if there's a significant shift among Hispanics, you might miss it. So that was the first. But the second change, the state polls in uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and especially in Wisconsin turned out to be very inaccurate. They, they showed Trump, uh, uh, Biden wins by between eight and 10 points. 
the final margin was fewer than one in Wisconsin um, and uh, just a little over that in Michigan and Pennsylvania. And there has been some discussion among pollsters that have been looking at on Twitter over the last couple of days. The general consensus here seems to be that there was a shy Trump voter and they were white college educated voters. Uh, so these were uh, voters who, who maybe lived in suburban communities. Their neighbors were all voting for Biden. They, you know, they, it's 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 the moral thing to do to vote for Biden in 2020. So they told pollsters they were voting for Biden, but when they got in the uh, in the polling place, they actually voted for uh, for Trump. So I don't think it was a single in in 2016. There was a single facet in the polling era, which is that they undersampled non-college educated whites. In 2020, it seems to be a, a more multi faceted error. But because Biden's lead was much more robust than Hillary's lead, the polling error did not lead to an incorrect call nationally. And there were a couple of state polls, Arizona and Georgia in particular, where the pollsters were almost completely right. And so this wasn't a case where the polling everywhere was wrong. It does seem to have been more of a more of a mixed bag. So with that, I'm happy to uh, to take questions. I'm sure that people uh, that people have some. Uh, uh, Casey, I'm going to turn to um, Professor Troyansky first because he had a polling related question in the chat. So, uh, Professor Troyansky, if you wouldn't mind, um, just okay. go ahead and speak your question because I think that's the easiest thing. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll actually look at the chat and remind myself what I said. Um, thanks, Casey. This was really enlightening. Um, and uh, I, I love the graphics um, and on such short notice. Um, but I have a methodological question or, or a historian's question. So you've written, you wrote in the 64 election, you've written on a presidential election. And I'm wondering how we write a history of this election when the narrative over the course of the year was driven by unreliable polling or unreliable enough polling. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it seems to me that we can take electoral results as data points, and you did that with 2016, 2020. Um, but that's useful when writing a history of, you know, the urban-rural divide or uh, mistrust of the state or racism or whatever. Um, but if you want to write a history of the two, 2020 election itself, um, does, the, the, does the strategy change for doing it? Yeah, the, the, this, is, this is a good question. So, so to, to answer the last question you asked in the chat, do we emphasize electoral results themselves and ignore polling? We can't because polling has become such an important part of the dynamic for the reasons you point out. It kind of drives and frames frames coverage. Even going back to the start of the campaign, the fact that Republicans, that Trump was polling relatively poorly against Biden in the winter and the spring is one reason why Republicans had so much difficulty recruiting candidates for the House. And so if that polling had actually been more accurate at the time, it's entirely possible Republicans would have taken back the House because there would have been, there would have been a lot more stronger. I mean, some of these Republican candidates were just, you know, they made the QAnon lady look uh, moderate by by comparison. So you can't just separate out the uh, uh, the the polling. And similarly, with regards to Biden's strategy, you know, we we don't know. We will know, but we don't know now what Biden's internal polling was showing. But there's nothing from his behavior that suggests that his internal polling was showing him doing much differently than the public polling. And if you look at Biden's strategy, it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Salima uh, had on her uh, screen at the start that she, you know, the 1948 campaign book that we that we did in our class. And, you know, the Biden strategy was similar kind of to the Dewey strategy, which was that he was so far ahead that his goal had to be to avoid making a mistake that would inflame the, um, you know, it, potentially tip the tip the election towards Trump. And so you know, that would now be the story, which is that Biden screwed up because he played it too safe. And so I think in telling a history of the election, you have to you'd have to sort of account for that because it plays such an important role. That said, um, you know, I think the 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 two critical points for which polling you, you do have to ignore the polling and look at the election results themselves are this this issue of the non-white voters you know, and again, th these are sm small numbers. So it's not as if a majority of non-white voters are moving towards Republicans. 
But it's not an insignificant pattern either. The only group of non-white voters that did not move towards Republicans in 2020 were Black female voters who remained just as reliably Democratic as they had been in 2016. Even Black male voters moved towards the Republicans. And that wasn't picked up in the polling much at all, and it has to be dealt with in the uh, in the campaign. And then secondly, there there is going to have to be a a close examination of what went on in the upper Midwest. And here, you know, you, you don't want to sort of overstate a single uh, a single thing. But the I think the the there are two the two best pollsters to me in the country right now are Nate Cohn, you know, who coordinates the New York Times polls uh, with Sienna, and a woman named Ann Seltzer. Um, who does the Des Moines Register polls, who pulls the Iowa caucuses, and is just, you know, she gets it right every single time. So Friday night, is it Friday night or is it, no, Saturday, Saturday night, um, the Des Moines Register released its final Iowa polls. Um, and everyone, you know, is on Twitter, it's released at 6 p.m. They're all waiting for the poll to come up. Um, and the polls there showed, um, uh, before this, showed Trump narrowly behind Biden in the presidential election in Iowa and Ernst behind by three or four points. And the Seltzer polls showed uh, Trump winning by seven and Ernst winning by five and Republicans winning every uh, House seat in the state. The final result was Trump won by seven, Ernst won by five, and Republicans won three of the four seats. They lost the fourth by one point. The reaction to this poll was outrage at Seltzer, that she was offering data that contradicted the narrative, and this might discourage Democrats from voting. Um, and so you just kind of raise the question of whether the you know, voices that were, you know, that might have challenged, you know, you know, were other pollsters getting some of these figures and saying, we're not going to release this because it doesn't it doesn't advance the 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 approach, and of course pollsters can't do that. I mean, you you know if if you're dealing with data, you just have to release the data and let the chips fall fall where they may. So I think yeah, in terms of of story of of histories of the 2020 election, the nature of the polling failure, especially after the polls had failed so significantly in 2016, half has to be addressed. But the critical difference I think between 2016 and 2020 is that there were some polls that were correct. I mean, in Wisconsin in 2016, everything was was wrong. Here it was, the you know, there, there were polls throughout that showed Biden really soft with Hispanics. And the argument always was, well, you know, they, they're not going to vote for a racist. And so, you know, don't, don't worry about it. And then turned out that the polls here were correct. Um, so, you know, you would hope that Democrats over the next four years will will take an, a different approach to this kind of data points. And when there's inconvenient data, try to grapple with the reasons why voters are saying this, other than just to try to pretend that the data somehow is is flawed. But the reaction to Seltzer, I mean, Seltzer has long been a liberal hero because she is the person who called the 2008 caucuses for Biden, uh, for, for Obama, when every other pollster showed a, a, a tie between Hillary and uh, and Obama. But she, she became this, overnight on Twitter, she became the Trump troll because she showed Trump winning Iowa and that just can't be happening, of course, and, and she, was, she was vindicated. Casey, I'm going to point to another question in the chat, which is, which is in fact, Professor Remy's. And you just brushed up against Professor Remy's question when we were talking about the, the nature of the Hispanic vote. Um, Steve, would you like to re-articulate your, your question? You're, you're muted. Zoom sucks. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I think I get that by now. Uh, first, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, and so... I, my question was, uh, uh, it was my understanding that among this incredibly complex entity, Hispanic voters in America, there is a significant gender divide with more men supporting Trump than women. If that's true, I also hear take away from what you're saying that there may be a, may be a similar dynamic among African-American voters with more yes. black men tending toward Trump. Yes than black women. Maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe there's some kind of connection between these two groups, but I, I would just, I'd love to hear what you, what, what your thoughts on all this. 
Yeah, I think it's it's a great question. I mean, we we have to be careful in two respects. The first is that, you know, as I said in the talk, polling of smaller demographic groups always can be uh, can be skewed. And secondly, exit polls, which we're all kind of looking at now, and which are really really great data to to sort of use, exit polls are always revised in the aftermath of the election. So there may be minor changes. But as it stands now, yes, I mean, you know, there there were gender gaps among Hispanic voters, among Black voters. Asian American voters, the 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 numbers are too small in the exit poll, but I would be very surprised if there wasn't a similar gender gap among Asian American voters as well. Now, to some extent, this is an obvious answer, which is that we live in a society that is polarized on the basis of gender and presidential elections as a whole. You know, male voters tend to be more Republican, female voters tend to tend to be more Democrat. Um, but it is it it is a kind of repudiation of the the kind of demography is destiny argument that voters of color are just going to overwhelmingly vote for for Democrats and there's no difference between men and women and how voters of color um, uh, approach things. One other thing I think with regards to Hispanic uh, uh, voters in particular, and again, you have to be really careful in terms of this this analysis because there's there are differentiations on the basis of state. For instance, in, in Arizona, there's a long tradition of Hispanic voters being politically engaged and very left. Uh, and there, there was no Hispanic movement towards towards Trump in 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 twenty uh, in twenty twenty. But in Florida and in um, uh, Texas, and I suspect in Colorado as well, although the data there hasn't been been clear yet. Um, you know the the emphasis on on socialism, the very very heavy emphasis in Southern Florida advertising on AOC, um, I think had a gen. You know, and the, and the, the, they hammered AOC, and the and the argument that they made for that the Republicans it was a very clever argument in Southern Florida was that the defund the police movement was targeted at at these Hispanic. You know, these are are, are are cities that are controlled by Hispanics in Southern Florida. So this this you know this was seen as an anti-Hispanic uh, uh, movement, and this is a it's a kind of rhetoric that I think is more appealing towards uh, towards male voters than female voters across uh, across the board. So the, the the other thing here, and this this was an issue in the run up to the election, there was very interesting polling done before the election among young African American male voters, um, and what that showed is a, a black female voters despised Trump. There was just there was there was no, no support, but among younger black male voters, there were indications that they. They didn't like Trump's policies, but they kind of liked Trump's willingness to take on the establishment. That you know that he was kind of fighting a, a kind of courageous fight in that respect, and it's a reminder that the, you know the kind of democratic approach to 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 minority voters as a whole, which is just sort of assume they're all going to be Democrats, and so you don't really need to do anything to cultivate them. Um, you know, almost came back to really bite them in this election, and certainly came back to bite them in the um, uh, in the in the Senate races. And you know, it's it's going to be hard for Republicans to put together this coalition of white working class voters and and sort of outreach to uh, to more uh, minority voters. But you could imagine someone like Nikki Haley, who did do this in South Carolina, um, or even Josh Hawley in Missouri, who I think is a kind of Trumpy figure, but without the Trumpist uh, race. Um, it would take a talented politician to do it, but they definitely could could do it. Uh, uh, Casey, we have yeah. time probably for only one or two more questions because I know yeah. that you have a hard stop. No, yeah, um, I can, but I, I yeah I can stay till three ten or three fifteen. But oh, no um, well, I, I then uh, allow me to to ask Salima's question, and perhaps Salima, would you like to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask? I'd be glad to have you do that. Sure. Um, let me read it. <laughs> yeah. um, Yes. Um, do you think there will be changes in the voting processes going forward? Um, for example, like there was more early voting this time, um, or even just in like how mail-in ballots are counted or handled, um, just like in general, what should we expect to see next time? Yes, yeah, it's a good question. So, so the 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 one pattern with regards to early voting, which you know begins really in the mid in, in an extensive way, begins in the mid '90s and accelerates after 2000, is that once changes are made, they are almost never taken back. So, even though a lot of the changes that were made in 2020 were technically COVID-related uh, 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 changes, this is a reminder. Uh, I have to turn off 
my Alexa. Um, so uh, they were, you know, technically um, COVID related changes. I think that I think that they'll still be there. So early voting, I suspect, is going to be here to stay in lots of these places. This idea of curbside voting, which we again sort of had in Maine before this, and so when when I was hearing all the controversy about this in the elections, like, we've had this for 20 years. It's, it's sort of normal thing. Um, it's hard to make an argument uh, against that. Mail voting, I do think there's going to be a reconsideration of mail voting in the aftermath of this election and, and fi try to find a way to push people more towards the towards the early voting. Now, the question then becomes, how does this change American politics? More than 100 million Americans voted early in 2020. So we now have an election month, not an election day. Um, you know, if, if, if there just were an election day, maybe Trump would have won this this time around because there does seem to have been a little surge towards Trump in the in the closing days. So clever candidates, and I don't think either Biden or Trump were particularly clever candidates in uh, in 2020, um, have to find ways to to sort of master that. And over the last 20 years, there is one person who stands out and an ability to, to profit from these rules, and that was Barack Obama. So the Obama campaign in 2008, which was the best run campaign of the last 40 years, understood if you mobilize especially young voters, people who might not go to the polls on election day, mobilize them, get their votes in early, then you can target the, the straddlers on, uh, on election day. So I suspect we'll see lots of discussion among sort of sharp, sharp people in both parties about how to, to do this uh, in 2024, but I think I think we should expect just as there were, you know, there's 100 million this time around, you know, maybe there'll be a few million less, I mean, in, in 2024, because people who just voted by mail because they were afraid of voting due to the virus. But I think we're going to see this, this kind of system remain in place permanently. This is very much connected to Jean-Michel's question about um, voter suppression. Um, and his question in particular had to do with Georgia, but we could probably broaden Jean-Michel's question, if you don't mind, um, to voter suppression nationwide and the impact it may have had on the election results. Yeah, all right. Th th this is a good question. And you know, it, as, as we understand voter suppression, th there are kind of two central uh, categories of it. And the first is the caricature, you know, and uh, we've all seen the photographs of, you know, white people with guns in the South trying to intimidate black people from uh, from voting. That that vote approach to voter suppression doesn't work with an early voting scheme because you can't have people with guns out there for 30 days before the election. You know, there's always an ability to uh, to vote. The second are 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 sort of procedural rules to make it hard to uh, to vote. And here, I think we need to have a better understanding of what is and is not voter suppression. So, for instance, voter ID rules, where where you have to get you know a. a a picture. The sole purpose here is to make it harder for people to vote. I mean, you know, the, the idea of in-person voting fraud where, you know, I, I vote and I pretend that I'm my father so I get to vote twice. I mean, that just doesn't happen and that's not going to affect an overall uh, election result. But by contrast, I, I was struck, and again, I'm, you know, I'm at home now with my father. My father's always watching MSNBC. And you know, in the run-up run to the election, they were constantly talking about Georgia and you know, long lines, voter suppression, blah, blah, blah. And this is just terrible. It was you know, Gwinnett County, one of these counties outside of Atlanta. And the reason was that in Gwinnett County, for understandable reasons, but nonetheless, it was what it was, all kinds of people decided they wanted to vote on the first day of early voting. And so there were these massive lines of four or five hours. On election day, it was a three minute wait to vote in Gwinnett uh, County. That's not voter suppression. That you know, the you know, counties can't be expected because you know this is expensive. And so, if you're you know, on these in these early votings, you know, your counties counties can't be expected to have a full time staff there for all 30 days of the early voting process. It, you know, it sort of doesn't work that way. So, you, you know. We have voter suppression in the country. It, it's 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 not a good tactic. But I think that that ironically, despite the the talk about it so much, in 2020 it it played a relatively minor role. And as we're moving towards more and more early voting, early voting acts as a natural disincentive to voter suppression. It's just much much harder. Um, uh, you know, to do it effectively in that kind of approach. And Georgia actually is a really good example here. I mean, you look at the turnout in Georgia in 2020, it was way higher than any other election um, uh, in the past, in large part because there were all of these early voting uh, opportunities. 
Uh, for, forgive me for the background sound in my apartment. It's it's uh, there's a lot of noise. Uh, Swapna asked a question about uh, the broader issue of of the progressive component of uh, the platform the Democrats ran on. Swapna, would you mind articulating what your question was? You're muted. Okay, thank you, Casey, for a really illuminating talk. Um, you know, I was thinking more about the immediate and the contingent factors that could have had a kind of upsetting uh, uh, impact on the polls. And I was thinking, you know, looking back, uh, 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 Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders kind of took a back seat since uh, Biden was nominated. Uh, I hope they could uh, do more. So do you think that had any impact? Uh, on the voters, particularly in terms of, you know, taking away the progressive edge from the Democrats and uh, tilting the balance, like Biden is winning, but still not the way we expected him to win. So I think that the, the, this is, there's a, there's a kind of two-pronged answer to this. With, with Warren, I think it was a deliberate tactic. So I'll talk about that in a second. With, with Sanders, I, I, I was giving a talk on, on the election in, uh, elsewhere in the spring. And you know, someone asked me what role I expected Sanders to play in the campaign. And, and my prediction then was that because he's a very health conscious individual, he would find it unable to campaign on behalf of the Democrats due to the virus. Uh, you know, he wasn't going to do anything for Biden. He didn't do anything really for Hillary in 2016. He has his sort of own agenda. But Warren, it's clear they made a deliberate decision to take Warren off the campaign trail. And so, you know, they, they, you know, their target, you know, and this was, I think, the smartest thing that the Biden people did. They didn't get greedy. They understood that, that to win, they had to win these white working class voters in, um, in the upper Midwest. Maybe Arizona and Georgia would be great, but the goal was to win where where they won. Um, and their polling must have suggested that her her numbers there were bad. I mean, she's been you know she worked cooperatively with Biden in the primaries. Remember when she sort of zinged Mayor Bloomberg in the in the debate? She stuck in the race really to help Biden. So it's clear you know. She, and, and she wants to be Treasury Secretary, which is now not going to happen because the Senate is so uh, is so close. So in, in the case of, of of her role, this I think was a deliberate tactical choice. So you ask yourself, what happens if she plays a more prominent role? Does that energize progressives in in sort of urban areas? Probably yes. I mean, you know, her her support in the primary was limited, but the people who liked her were passionate about her in a way I think they were not passionate about Biden. But does that, you know, you know, in, if she's if she's addressing a Westchester uh, County audience of liberal Democrats and she goes off on fracking, does that then become an ad that the Republicans use in in Pennsylvania? So I think probably here, given the tensions that uh, that were in Biden's, um, uh, you know, in sort of Biden's appeal. The, the tactical decision probably was correct, even though I suspect you are also correct, which is that it did have some negative impact on progressive turnout in, uh, in, in other states. Thank you. That was the last of the questions. Um, I am open to one or two more, but we do need to let Professor Johnson go. He also has another meeting to run to. Oh, uh, can I, oh, sorry. I was gonna ask if I can ask a question. Yes, please, Stanley, go ahead. Uh, for the polls, are they gonna, like how long before they regain the credibility? Cause I just don't trust polls these days, that's why. It's, it's, it's not an unreasonable question. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that it, you, this, this was a hard election with, with polls for a couple of reasons. The, the first is that there seem to be some polls um, the Trafalgar polls, those of you who closely followed polling uh, aggregates might have noticed them, that seem to just be existing to, to sort of gin the numbers back towards Trump. So you, you would see these stretches where it would be a state and every single thing in the state would be Biden plus six and Biden plus eight. And there'd be a Trafalgar poll showing, you know, Trump plus four. And it was like, you know, this doesn't make any sense. They're clearly not. So so this is the first thing. The, the second thing I think that we learned from this election, which, which we, we should have learned from 2016 as well, is that 
that there is some sort of obligation on all of us to be more sophisticated connoisseurs of polling. So, you know, Ann Seltzer, who I mentioned, you know, before, or, or Nate Silver, or, or Nate Cohn from the Times, um, you know, these are polls that I think are generally fairly reliable. And there's a great tool here, which which Nate Silver's site um, uses, is they, they actually rank pollsters and they grade them from A plus to, I don't think he gives any Fs. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an easy grader, but I think he gives a couple, you know, he gives Ds. And, you know, I think one of the things we probably learned from this election is that even B is not a high enough grade for, for pollsters. So one of the polls that consistently gets Bs and maybe B plus from, from Silver is the Quinnipiac poll, the university poll. And probably a lot of you saw that because it got their polls were just wild towards Biden throughout the race. And so they, they had a Florida poll that showed Biden winning by seven points. I mean, it's just like, this doesn't even make any sense. Um, so I think that really looking forward uh, with regards to, to, uh, to polling, we have to um, you know, be more selective in terms of the polls that we, um, that we look at. One, um, one final point with regards to polling, they didn't do it this time around, but they did do it in 2018, the Times-Siena poll. If you go, if, and, and they still may have some of these on the Upshot uh, website from the New York Times. What they did was to take a, take a look at, they, they allowed you to follow the poll as it was occurring. So it would show we're calling person X and it would show, and I, I loved watching this, I had a good time, it would show up at a little dot and the dot would uh, appear. And what, what, was, what was demonstrated from this was that they, they called hundreds of people just to get one respondent. So in this environment, we, it, you know, it may be that polls are just unable to get a representative sample unless, and this was the critical unless, you have the New York Times and can spend, you know, $70 million, or however much they spend. So they were able to hire, you know, call, call companies. And so they would call, you know, 25,000 people to get a representative sampling of 700. Most pollsters couldn't do this. So I think that's the lesson to me that we have to learn from this. We just have to be much more restrictive. And it's fun when you see one of these crazy polls that comes, comes out, but unless, unless it's coming from a source that you know and that you agree with, just, just basically ignore it. Uh, one final no, I, Stanley, I'm afraid we really have to. Okay, yeah, I understand. I'm sorry. Um, Professor Johnson, my grateful thanks. Um, once again, this is uh, enlightening. You know, we, we rely on you for this kind of insight and, and, um, and we'll call on you again, I promise. Um, many thanks. Everybody take it easy. Try to be kind to yourself this weekend. Go to sleep, eat well, um, and we'll see you next week in class. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.